Oh. Now I've got audio and way too much. There. Just, I mean, there. I think I'm hearing audio in the stream now. Dar Jr. hears us. Hi, Dar Jr. So I just did it in the set. I just did it in the in the settings of OBS, and it was able to. Although um, I want the two of you to say stuff to make sure it works. No, it's just working for me. <laughs> oh, that's no fun. So let me change that, but then how can I? So it's pulling me in okay now, but it doesn't have either of you. <sighs> Dave. That's Dar Jr.'s name. Yeah, Tracy's just gonna hold up signs. <laughs> That'll do well. <laughs> That's right. Can you write backwards, Tracy? Oh, well, yeah, that looks okay. Uh, audio. So it still isn't pulling audio from anybody else. Is, is there a way to just have it grab system audio? So then everybody just hears what I hear? Not that it's going to let me. Uh, spoilers, bye. Oh, okay. <laughs> Right. Yeah, I appreciate it. Where, 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 where are you seeing that? Uh huh. Uh, on the mixer. So I've got, just got the mic auxiliary, which is what's capturing my audio. So I add that under sources, right? Audio, audio output capture. Uh huh. That's the one with the. Okay, so I've got one. Yeah, but there's no device. There's no devices. No, well, just I think it's uh, yeah, no devices. Not even default. Yeah. <laughs> Built in microphone, my Yeti. No. 
media sources like if I want to play like a song or something. Yeah. Is that cause, which, which, which I know because I already tried it earlier. Uh, Dave says that you should be painting signs, Tracy, that you can hold up. Yeah. <laughs> he also he also says that what we have seems to sound better for now, but try what? Video capture device. You know, it might be faster if I just Google real quick. Oh, okay. Well, a quick search says that in order to make it work, I would need a, to download Soundflower, which I don't think I have installed on this machine anymore. So, so I've used it before for things. Is there, a, if I just do, Display capture. And then everybody has to see all of my stuff. And then I can full screen, but then I can't see the script. Then I can't see the stream. <laughs> but I don't know, maybe people might be able to hear you now. Where is my... Thing is, I can't see the stream to know if people can hear you. I'm opening the channel on my phone though, so I can watch the chat from there. Okay. Yeah, we uh, we seem to be futzing with stuff right now, anyway. So. All right. Where are you seeing that? Uh huh. <laughs> Ironically, if I unplugged my headphones. And just played the system audio. <laughs> My microphone might pick it up. Because <laughs> I'm kind of faintly hearing you, I think, through my headphones to the microphone <laughs> when I on the stream. But it's not showing me the chat unless uh, nobody's posted anything. Oh, I think the issue is that I'm, I'm not live. That's interesting. That is not even the right thing. What is it doing? I don't even know what the... Well, what do you think? It's already nine o'clock. Do we give up, go back to, go back to Skype and do a little more research? Okay.
Yeah. Okay. Hang on, people in the in the chat, uh, which may just be Dave. Um, I don't know who else may be there. Um, but hey, well, but I think one of those is me and one of those is Tracy. Uh, <laughs> so so hang on, hang on. I think we're gonna give up on Zoom for now until I do some more research and see if I can figure out how to get the audio to work. Uh, we're gonna go to back to Skype and and try that out. All right, so hang out a second. Let me switch back over to the opening card. We'll be right back. All right, I'm going to hang up Zoom, and we're going to switch back to Skype. Hey, I can see and hear you. Let me. Uh huh. Yeah, it does. Oh, there you are. And then I can add you very easily because I already have you saved. Your um, Skype saved here. What are you doing? Uh, not you. Sorry, I'm trying to make it so it doesn't mess with your resolution. And apparently, I was futzing with the wrong feed. I was changing the banner instead of you. Uh huh. Oh, but that's right, but Zoom doesn't. said to remove Keith. Oh. Move Tracy up top. All right, should I go back to live so at least people can see us on the stream? Okay. All right, so we're back on the stream. Sorry about the uh, experimentation not going smoothly, but I guess that's why you experiment, right? But I do think it's time to try to get this thing going. You still running like 15,000 games a week these days? Oh, okay. <laughs> Seriously, Tim?
Wow, eight or nine games a week. That's that's hardcore. <laughs> wow. I uh I play with my regular group and then I, I I've been playing with my kids. Um they Hey Trace. Um they they're done with school. Their last day of school for the year was yesterday. Uh, and I've been I've been playing um, Titans Grave uh, with them. Ooh. So um, I've I've played through the beginnings of it before with a school group, and I never got very far. And I decided, oh, look, this is a good game. It's really easy and fun for you know. There's enough robustness there for my 14 year old, but it, but it's also straightforward enough for my eight year old. Um, Mm-hmm. And, and I and I love the the Titans Grave sort of web series that Will Wheaton did with with all the the players that he had and all that. Um, and there's some things that are different in the adventure than what he ran, like because I don't think the adventure was actually written entirely at that point that he was running it. Mm-hmm. And there was this one scene where um, in the adventure that wasn't in the stream where it's like, oh well. Their ship might crash here, and they meet this sort of junk scavenger, and she's kind of crazy. Oh, i got to fix the echoes. Um, that should do it, except now you can't hear anybody. Oh, no. Yeah, you should, that should do it. Sorry. Um, so, But, yeah, so um, it's got the, you know, you meet this crazy, you know, junk sort of scrapper out in the the wastelands and whatever uh and she helps you fix the ship and then she's like oh and you're going to that place uh just make sure that you don't leave until my family comes back they're first they went in first so they should get to leave first don't come back you know but she's kind of mad and whatever uh and and it's all just a, mm-hmm. a big setup for this uh spoiler alert uh for people do, uh running titan's grave that's been out for a long time now um it's all just sort of a setup for oh, and then you get there and find out, of course, because it's been a long time that they're they're dead, right? Well, it turns out they're not just mm-hmm. dead. They they the the AI, the rogue AI, has converted them into cyborgs, right? Oh wow! And that was the last scene that we played tonight, and my little one got really upset. Like it had the that emotional impact that it, that it's supposed to, mm-hmm. but like he refused to fight he refused to attack them he used every action to try to persuade them to get through to them uh, you know oh. but, but i mean at that point i mean they're basically zombies at that point you know so um so it was rough like he was he was really um impacted by that now i gotta be like okay well how do i you know that's where we stop so like i gotta find some way to mm-hmm. make that okay you know and um, oh, you found their, their memory chips or whatever. You can bring that back to her, you know, so I, I'm hoping, because he was really concerned about that. So, poor sweet kid. <laughs> you got to do that late, that episode of Doctor Who where he first face, and she dies, but the, she doesn't really, because she, like, gets saved in some kind of database or something. Right, uh, uh, yeah, 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 uh, River, in, in the, the, in the yes. trees, yeah, in the library in the trees. Tracy? Yes. Can you say something so that we know that things sound okay? Yeah, can you hear me now? I can hear you. I hope we can hear it's you. okay in the, in the stream as well. For Dave and... Oh, we got a few more people on there now, too. Woohoo. I'm happy yeah, with my background. I, I saw that, yeah. I was... Uh, I mean, I, I put up all this lovely art, and, and I showed you earlier-ish uh, uh, that I got my, my mm-hmm. Claudio Poses uh, stained glass uh, descent into Avernus art posted now. Yes. Um, so I got all the, that art back there, but I was using um, art from um, the, the Return to the Lazy Dungeon Master, Mike Shea's um, thing. The, one of the cover arts for that was my background for a while he's and and i used it uh on an episode uh behind the dm screen he's like you know if you're going to use that background you have to like promote one of my things every 30 seconds that's the rule (laughs) (laughs) i'm like well actually because it's video capture for me and running through skype for everybody else nobody else can actually see the virtual background i'm using it's just you (laughs) well I I'm surprised it was only if you're going to use the art. Right. <laughs> well, yeah, that's a good point. I mean, 
he's on the show. I figure thirty percent of the episode is is him <laughs> promoting stuff, right? <laughs> <So>. <laughs> All right, now we are well past our starting time, uh, so we should go ahead and get going. I should figure out where my script went. There we are. All right, thanks for being patient, uh, those of you in the chat. Um, sorry about the issues uh, that we've had as we've been experimenting, trying to find better stuff. Uh, Dave says that he lost someone. Who did you lose? Is the stream still playing for me? Oh, uh, no. Is the audio okay on the stream? I haven't checked it since we switched. Hmm. Tracy, say a thing. You might hear. I'm saying something. Perfect. And then I can at least make sure that... Yeah, it seems the audio seems to be going okay. Uh, so, Dave, if there's an issue, please let me know. It sounds okay for me. The stream is running okay. I'm not dropping a ton of frames. Um, in fact, I we actually dropped more frames. It says on uh, when we were using Zoom, and we haven't. It doesn't look like we've dropped anything since we switched over to Skype this time. So, we're gonna cross our fingers and hope that things are turning out okay. Uh, but it's late, so I want to go ahead and get started recording, and hopefully things are okay. Sound good for everybody? All right. Yep. Then I will hit record. Where did you go? Well, that's... Oh, because I moved it off to the side. I'm like, where'd the record button go? I moved it off the window. Okay. All right. It is recording the audio now. Whoa. And let's get going. This episode of The Tome Show is brought to you by listeners like you. Thanks for using The Tome's Amazon and DMs Guild affiliate links and for becoming patrons at patreon.com slash the tome show. Welcome to The Tome, a D&D news, reviews, and interviews show, and I'm your tome host, Jeff Greiner. And I'm Tracy Hurley, and this episode number 340, we're going to figure out how to get every last drop from our monsters as we talk about the book, The Monsters Know What They're Doing. And we're keeping it small and agile this time around. Just myself, Tracy, and Ismail Alvarez, the, the Tome Show social media manager, right? Uh, so welcome back, Ish. Yes. Good to be back. Sweet. And this episode, we're talking about The Monsters Know What They're Doing by Keith Amon. The idea started from his blog of the same name, wherein he would write up analysis and strategies of how to run various D&D monsters. The book collects and revises some of those and adds to the concept as well. It is highly acclaimed when it was released, and we finally decided it was time to take a closer look for ourselves. Uh, so before we dive further into this, I want to thank all of the listeners who support the show. Doing so is easy. You can go shopping at DMs Guild or Amazon, just like you normally would. Uh, but you get there through the links at thetomeshow.com, and we get a small percentage. Or you can support us directly through Patreon at patreon.com slash thetomeshow, just like Leonard Pelche, Jill Sanders, Doug Palmer, Merrick Blackman. You can give a dollar a month, five dollars a month, ten dollars a month. Uh, occasionally we'll have some people that support us at that level. Um... Those people are fantastic supporters of the show, and I thank them all for doing so. Okay, so in the interest of disclosure, whenever we're doing reviews, I always like to do a little uh, disclosure um, to m see who's working from review copies or not, just in case that matters to our listeners. And for once in this case, I am not, uh, I do not have anything to disclose. I not only purchased this book, I purchased it twice. I got the Kindle. I bought the Kindle version and I bought the uh, Audible version, so I could listen to the audiobook version specifically for this review. Anybody get review copies that you need to disclose, or are we all working from purchase copies? No, I bought my EPUB off of uh, the Google Play Store. Yeah, and I bought an electronic book as well. So uh, I do have one disclosure, even though it's not book club, that I'd like yeah. to make. And that's, and that's just because of time, and I think we'll talk about how much is in this book. Uh, I, didn't, I will admit right up front, I did not read everything to every level of detail 
uh, given the amount of time I had to read it. I hope that's okay just to say up front, just in case. Fair. So people can, can know going into I'm it in what your experience was with the book. Uh, absolutely. Um, there were certainly, like I listened to, a, since we've been stuck at home for the last few months, um, I have spent a, a lot of my, I've been trying to stay in shape and so I've been running uh, three times a week, uh, usually for an hour or so at a time. So I listened to a lot of the book that way. Um, and occasionally, you know, your mind wanders. And so I may have missed a few things here and there, of course. Uh, and, and having an audio book, I don't have, I, I, you know, I can't jot down notes in the margins and that kind of stuff like I might otherwise do. But, um, but I did manage to get through all of it. I just finished it literally this morning. Um, I wrapped up the last, I, I got through the end credits of the, of the book. So, um, so let's talk about what this book is. Exactly. Like Tracy described it a little bit in our intro that this that it started out as a blog and then at least according to our interview um, that we already did, but will come later in the episode, um, somebody approached the author um, to turn with with the idea of turning it into a book. Um, and so he, it was basically just sort of his blog was breaking down, like, how do you tactically how do you run? each monster and, you know, working his way through the monster manual and all that. And I'd like to actually give a take on what I think the book is. Um, I'm not sure how, how other people will feel, but um, one of the things I think, cause I started with D and D with fourth edition. And one of the things that's always a bit difficult is they kind of just throw you in and a lot, and particularly with fifth edition, a lot of it's been about story, high level story and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But the idea of what exactly those stat blocks and what alignment and things like that should translate into to actually make a physics type world um, is a part that's often missing. And you, so really what my, my take on what he was doing is saying, what does it mean when you have intelligent, and I think older editions did this to some degree is like, you know, this is the baseline of intelligence for humans. So what does it mean in terms of how you think and what types of decisions you would make and things like that? And once you have that framework of what those various stats might translate into, how to then use that to think through what the different creatures uh, in the monster manual would actually be like, given that we can't just all go to a zoo or something like that and, and observe them. Yeah. And, and it's like, on one hand, it is very much a tactics book. It's a how do you play these creatures intelligently and, and effectively. But he frames it in such a way where he says, yes, but it's only a tactics book in as much as the, the creatures know what their strengths and weaknesses are, right? And they, they would behave according to their strengths and weaknesses. So it's in many ways, it's really a role-playing book. It's about analyzing the, the mechanical elements of the stat block and figuring out the appropriate way to role play the creature in that regard, right? Right. And I think, and I know I've been going back to fourth edition a lot lately in terms of thinking through things, but I think that was one of the things that people talked about that it felt like the mechanics were divorced from the real world reality. Um, and you could even say that if, if someone doesn't give an explanation of what all the ability scores and things like that mean to this level, then you would say the same thing. The monsters, they just kind of exist and there's no real idea of how they fit into a world. So, And this is what he talks about a lot is like it leads to this whole idea that the monster r runs in and goes stabby stabby. And it doesn't matter if it's a goblin or a kobold or a dragon. They're all just going to go stabby stabby all the time. It, it, Ish, is your is your take on sort of the purpose of this book similar? Yeah, um, what struck me uh, really uh, strongly about this book was that uh, it's yes, it's a tactics book, but it tries to veer away from this kind of like um, computer game style simulation of Dungeons and Dragons. When I say that, we probably most of us who play D and D have grown up playing like, you know, those gold box games or, you know, some version of them, Neverwinter Nights and so on and so forth. And every monster you fight, every encounter is to the death. 
uh, everything is like you just kind of stand there and chop at each other until one side goes down. Um, and that's, I think we, I think a lot of us were trained to run encounters that way. Uh, and it, it's, it's um, like uh, one of my old piano teachers told me, it, it's going to take you just as long to unlearn the wrong way as it is to relearn the, the right way. Uh, and so I think a lot of us, like I'll, I'll say this from myself, you know, I, I had internalized a lot of the lessons of this book, uh, you know, in the last, I don't know, five years, but we're talking like five out of 20, where the whole rest of the time I was just like, okay, everyone is on either side. Okay, now you guys, you know, hit each other until one, you know, one side or the other is done. Um, and it, it really kind of lays out a foundation for, no, it doesn't have to be that way, you know, and, and it helps too, because the players will learn that they can run away if you show them that the enemies can run away because a lot of players are like no we have to fight this we we can't run away because that's just what you do uh, and that was a lot of what i saw laid out in this book it's a really good guidebook for no you don't have to you don't have to run it like a computer simulation you can you can let them kind of live and breathe yeah absolutely and, and i think the the use case for this book is interesting as well. Like, I feel like having sort of listened to and or read this book cover to cover, I've reflected on some sort of generalized things. Like, I've, I feel like I've learned some things. Um, and and as, I, as people will hear me mention in the interview later, um, I feel like tactics, monster tactics, is one of my weaknesses as a DM. Uh, so that's where part of my interest in this came from. Um, but I, but I, so I feel like I've internalized some ideas, some themes along the way. But I don't think that's the primary intended use case for this book, right? I don't think that's how he envisions. And, and, and he more or less said as much in the interview, as I recall. Uh, Tracy, you can correct me if I'm wrong. But, but the vision is like, oh... I've got an encounter with kobolds. Let me go read coming up in the next session. Let me go up and read quickly on the kobold, uh, you know, tactics or, or what have you. Uh, and, and I think that's the primary use case, right? Like I, I paid a lot of attention to the, to the undead section because I currently am running Curse of Strahd and that seems really relevant to me, you know? Um, and, and and I think that's good. Like to, to specifically think, oh, well, here's what the vampire spawn tactics look like. I've got vampire spawn in my next session. Like now I've got some ideas of, of how to run that. And they're fairly straightforward and not honestly that difficult to run, but it did change my thinking about their motivation and how that encounter should play out. Um, but I think there's also some, some larger themes that you might pick up along the route. Did, did you have similar experiences where you, you internalize some larger themes, but recognize that that's not really what the book is intended to do? I mean, I certainly did, um, just going through. Um, it really was about, like, you know, almost a playbook for, for each individual monster type. And I can see that utility of going back. That's why I say I, I bought this as an EPUB. I want to buy it as a book because I'm going to learn I'm going to, you know, throw paper clips in there because I'm going to be going back to it very, very often, I imagine. Uh, but, yeah, just when it, when it starts to change the way that you look at encounters... And it's very, very helpful in that way. It starts to change just your whole attitude about encounters overall, which, like you mentioned, I don't think that was the, the intention, but I think that it's a, a happy side effect for sure. Tracy, how does that match up to your experience with the book? I think that matches up pretty well. Um, I do remember at the very beginning, I think it's the introduction when he talks about how he approached the... Um, the ability scores and stuff like that to try to to give it uh, a real world, like a not a real world, but the whatever the physics of that world is, mm -hmm. sort of thing. And so I, I don't know when he started the blog if he intended to give this overarching, like how you might be able to bring that about. But I think over the course of doing it, that came through mm -hmm. to me. Mm -hmm. so so yeah so let's let's talk about some of the the larger because because 
I don't think most people would or necessarily even should just seek to read this book cover to cover, right? They should they should get this book and then pull up the pages they need for the upcoming session that they're running, I think. Um, and that's, I think, the smart... Like, it, it was a... Like, the audiobook was 25 hours. That was... That's a long audiobook, <laughs> you know? It was a... It was a... It's a significant... Like, it's a textbook on running monsters. Um, mm-hmm. So so I don't think I would advise people to necessarily pick it up and run it, sort of... Uh, or, or read it cover to cover. But I did think that I picked up some, some ideas and some thought processes along the way of doing that. So, so what sort of the bigger, what are some of the bigger themes that, that we all picked up as we read it through like this? Who wants to start? I'll start. Uh, so I, I didn't, as I mentioned earlier, I didn't get to read the whole book, but I went through and kind of picked little segments of it with each creature type and so on. Uh, that I thought would be interesting to me. For instance, Minotaurs I've always loved, and I wanted to see what insight he had on those. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I looked in there, and um, I, I read that in the Knoll section, and they were very similar in that he goes very hard into the specific um, style that they're presented in the Monster Manual. Uh, and so he uh, kind of breaks down, like, well, these are the different kind of Knolls that are in the Monster Manual. This is how you can use them in their own individual way and why their abilities are important and how they function in combat and so on. Um, so the same thing was with the Minotaur, although the Minotaur had a little bit more flavor to it and it had a little bit more like this is, you know, the origins of the Minotaur and like, well, see, Minotaurs are nocturnal, so you're probably going to find them at night and so on and so forth. But um, it really... Um, kind of made you think of them it, it it almost reminded me of the old uh dungeon magazine or sorry dragon magazine uh monster ecology sections but it was a little bit more intentional it wasn't like this is like a national it wasn't like a national geographic kind of style presentation like the the monster ecology right. section was it was more like well think about it logically this is what you see in their stat blocks and this is what that means in the real world and when you when you think about it that way then it translated. It translates into these monster actions, and it translates into these monster strategies. Um, and in that way, it kind of uh, unbound me to think a little bit more. Like, well, you should, I should be thinking of the, about these monsters more holistically, uh, and I should be considering that they're not just, uh, you know, a monster that exists in a dungeon in a ten foot square room for no reason. They 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 are, uh, live out there in Faerun or you know, um, uh, Eberron or wherever. And they have to fit into that context in a way that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Tracy, did you have any sort of uh, overarching lessons or themes that you saw that you wanted to discuss? I don't know if it counts as an overarching one, but one of the big things is when I first started, uh, I wouldn't even call it doing design. I remember somebody told me that you're not supposed to change like the spell list of a monster or an NP uh, adversary Mm. in response to what the players are doing because that's not fair for some reason and I liked the fact that this book challenges that Mm -hmm. (laughs) when it makes sense like you're not gonna Mm -hmm. suddenly make everything that way but when it makes sense you should have that reaction because it leads into the players impacting the world Mm -hmm. Especially when it's not a native, like it's not a natural spell, right? If, if it's a creature that inherently has some sort of spell-like ability, that's one thing. But if it's the Archmage, like, why do they all have to have the same spell list? That's ridiculous. And even and I would argue even Watsi and their design has challenged that in 5th edition because they've explicitly published, like, use the Archmage stat blocks, but change the spell list, you know, in this way, you know, so... I think that's... Right, but it was even things like, you know, as the player characters are going through mm. encounters with the Archmage's underlings, right? Like, they're right. It, it's going to learn what they use right. and mm. may end up deciding to challenge them in different ways. Uh, uh-huh. Yeah, that, that, <laughs> that stuck out uh, as particularly poignant again for me because I'm running Curse of Strahd, right? And one of the things about Strahd is, like, he has spies everywhere. 
and and he runs into the players a bunch and tests them and figures out who focuses on what and who you know so when 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 um, Keith in this book talks about how if you have a really intelligent mos- monster you can simulate that by letting them sort of read the players stats um, which on one hand I could see some players crying foul <laughs> that hey the monster shouldn't know my wisdom score or whatever um, but on the other hand, like the the right monsters kind of should, and Strahd definitely should, right? Because mm-hmm. Strahd just spent the last three weeks doing a crash course study on you, right? And, and he's real smart, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so I think he even um, in this book, Keith even mentioned um, the idea of like, or maybe it was just in our chat <laughs> during the interview. Which I don't remember exactly now, but the idea of like figure out what what the the creatures spells are going to be and like it's okay to just mark up in the stat block like oh no cast this in round one on such and such player cast you know like prep your your combat in that way like these are the spells and this is who they're supposed to target because that's who they're going to be most effective against um so i think that's that's a good point as well um and i don't think you have to have a, a an npc or a monster that that spends weeks studying the the players in order to be able to do some of that. Right. Uh, and I think that's to Tracy's point. Um, spells were a big part of what I, what I thought about as I went through some of my overarching themes. Right. Um, because spells are hard. It's one of the reasons I really liked running in fourth edition. Cause it wasn't hard. Like everything had a little block that told you exactly what mm-hmm. it did. And there was no just like, Oh yeah. And it has access to all these spells. Like if it had, if this, creature had access to fireball there was a little block of text that described what their fireball does right i didn't have to go hunting things down and looking things up um and 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 now we're back to here this creature has a as this spell list right um and that's the way it's been done for a long time and it, and it you know i get it but it's also that's the hard part to me that's the part that i struggle mm-hmm. with as a dm especially like i can figure out you know grapple before you attack or whatever right that's that's um that's usually easy enough to figure out, but spells are hard because then there's now I've got ten new abilities I got and I have to reference other pages in other books sometimes and figure all that stuff out and uh, it can be a mess. Um, but I think particularly that what the, the two things in terms of spells that stood out to me that I need to do better at um, is I need to do a better job of tracking the action economy like figure like the the idea that spiritual weapon is a bonus action like don't forget that in the middle of the combat every single creature that can mm-hmm. cast but can can cast spiritual weapon should be throwing out spiritual weapon because it's it's a mm-hmm. it's a free action and then a free attack um I, I i think there was a lot more focus on defensive spells uh and using things to make the creature last longer um because one of my critiques i guess uh with this uh book was that like he will lay out like this is what creatures do on round one two three four and i'm like the odds that any of my creatures are going to last longer than two rounds is pretty slim like i don't i don't need Mm -hmm. really complex thought processes and analyses on how to how to play this creature because they're not going to live that long anyway uh but if i did if i was smarter about some of those defensive things maybe they would (laughs) get a couple more rounds out of it right (laughs) um uh, and then, oh, the other th- spell thing that I realized, I don't think I've ever done in 5th edition, and it's stupid that I haven't, is is the one, the spells that can be upgraded by using a higher slot. Mm. Yeah, duh, of course they can, but I don't think it ever even occurred to me to do that with my monsters. Um, but that's, you know, it's such a no-brainer, but like, yeah, I needed that to be pointed out to me, apparently, after all these years of playing 5th edition, because I never thought to do it. Um, and that's huge. Because then then it's not like, oh, well, here's a spell they have, at, 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 you know, here's their 4th level spell slots. Well, there's nothing there that's particularly useful. I'll just skip 4th level spell slots. I don't know. I'll just cast a 3rd level spell. No big deal. Yeah, but then make it better, you know? <laughs> Why not? So... Um, so mm-hmm. that was huge for me, too. And then and then I think some of the things that, that you all talked about, the idea of... of um, because one of my concerns is if you make the the creatures more strategic, right? There was a lot of like goblins uh, hiding behind cover and being harder to hit and doing all that kind of stuff. Um, that's very tactically sound. 
but then part of me is like, yeah, but then that just drags out the fight too. Like, I don't want a, a relatively simple fight against goblins to last all night, right? Um, but then we also get run into, well, I think what you mentioned, Ish, right? But they're also going to like, they're, they're really into self-preservation. They're going to surrender. They're going to run away. They're going to do other things because they want to survive more than they want to probably win this fight. Mm-hmm. So, so yeah, there were some good sort of overarching themes here that I think were, were interesting and useful to think about. I do wonder too, though, if that's like an interesting, kind of an interesting meta point about fifth edition and earlier editions. The, Cause Part of what you're talking about with this, the spell slots, like just use it at a, uh, use it as a higher level and and increase it. That has to do with the fact that there are spells that everyone can do. They're not powers like in 4e, uh, where it just was what it was, right? Like I know they they try to introduce ways of of increasing the power of them, but and as a DM, how do you keep track of all of that? Yeah, that's where you would have to do advanced prep and 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 think through it on this level and then the question is what does that do to your game in terms of do you just specialize on certain monsters <laughs> so that way uh, you just know it more because i don't have the ability to memorize uh 25 hours of content to not it's not a knock against no, it it's absolutely. just more like just yeah. no absolutely and i think that's i think that's fair i think i mean my go-to is going to be that i'm going to start using it i'll start looking through um to prep for like key encounters for each session. Let me just read the handful of pages that are particularly relevant to, to what I think is going to be the, the most uh, exciting encounter in the upcoming session. So then I'm just reading a few pages a week and, and refreshing myself or whatever. I think that's p- part of what I do. Um, and, and, but then even then, like if there's a couple of mages or whatever, and that's a lot of prep in terms of going through all the spells. I, I mentioned to a few people from this reading this book, like I want to go through my monster manual and every time I see a spell list, put a little symbol next to every single thing that be, that can be cast as a reaction or as a bonus action, and then put a little symbol next to, you know, a little asterisk next to every single spell that can be upgraded with a higher slot, just to remind myself. And then I realized I haven't actually used my monster manual in over a year because I've been running all my monsters through D&D Beyond. Uh, and I can't, mm-hmm. I can't mark up D&D Beyond, unfortunately. Um, that would be great, but that would be fairly difficult functionality, I think. Um, but I think you can at least hover over a spell in D&D Beyond that I'm hoping... I'm going to test it out this weekend. Uh, actually, tomorrow at my game, so I can test it out and see if I hover over it. Does it give me enough information real quick on the, on the fly to make a decision about what spells are useful and which ones uh, are not necessarily that, that useful in the situation? So... We're going to see how, how that goes. But I think uh, Tracy's sort of questioning of this moves us into an, in- an, an interesting sort of final question about the book. Uh, like, it gives a lot of advice and a lot of tactics, but what do we think of that advice? Like, is it generally sound? Do we have critiques? Are there areas where, where we might think differently than, than the author? Uh, where are we at with that? So, um, I've, you know, I, I've had uh, a bit of experience writing for third uh, party companies and what have you, uh, doing monster design. And as I do, uh, every, every successive monster makes me appreciate the stat block all the more because I've always said the stat block tells its own story. Uh, previous versions of D&D and what have you would have these stat blocks that are like this long and then they would have like another little thing that would say these are the tactics and that was kind of handy it's not what is in this book that we're talking about um it was kind of helpful but not especially especially since it didn't really cover too many situations um but those were bloated and they felt kind of like too and I'm calling out third edition so you can you can at me on Twitter if you want. But um, the fifth edition stat block tells you what the monster does and how it does it. Um, and I'm a little embarrassed to say that this, the, you know, um, the monsters know what they're doing. This book uh, did a much better job of kind of putting that out there than I ever could have as far as the, the idea of it. But like, no, you can see what the monster does. You can see how they interact with each other. You can see why, um, you know, um, 
hobgoblins work so much better as a group because they have something in their stat block that says that they do. Uh, and goblins are so much better at doing hit and runs because they have things in their stat blocks that say that they do. Uh, and, you know, displacer beasts and the beholders and so on and so forth. Uh, they were all created, and, and you know, I, I hope that all the other monsters, too, were created very intentionally, not just to, not just to like, make a monster that has the name of the thing that you want to fight, like, uh, you know, an owlbear, just so that you can, you know, check, check a uh, box off, but that uh, they're made very intentionally to, like, do a thing that's very uh, specific. So when you fight a purple worm, uh, you know, you're you know you're in for a fight, and you know that it's going to be this like big uh, drag out fight, and it's going to uh, where gonna people are going to get yeah. swallowed. <laughs> exactly. Um, and when you fight uh, a beholder, you know that you're going to have to like be dodging eye rays, and and you could be petrified or killed, and that you know all bets are off. Uh, so this book, you know, the I, I didn't look again. I didn't look through everything, but what little I did, it seemed to really lay that out. These monsters are made to fight this way, uh, and they don't have to fight to the death. You can decide that, you know, depending on their ability scores. You can, depend, you know, uh, figure that out depending on what uh, the, you know, uh, description of them says. But they don't all have to be, you know, uh, mannequins for you not, to knock down. Uh, and I think that they it did a really good job of just expressing and detail and, and for virtually every monster in the monster manual just how you do that and exact of make it go from the the page to the table mm -hmm. tracy what do you think of the the advice uh in general i like it um and i like again i mean i think you know that i do this a lot with uh all of my blog posts and stuff like that it's about what are these mechanics imply about the world and and talk about with the world uh one of the things i do wonder though is if and how the assumptions might change between uh planes or versus in the multiverse mm -hmm. you know because what's true about the, the alignment in one area might not be true in another and i know we talk about it a little bit with him uh mm -hmm. you know and just just thinking through that a little bit more might be interesting mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's true. I think there's, um, it's a very, like, he has a method of analysis, and it's very good at what it does, right? Um, but there's also, like, there's some consideration for alignment, but his consideration for alignment is basically that, like, if it's evil, uh, it starts off as hostile. <laughs> if it's good, it starts off as friendly, uh, you know, and if it's neutral, it, it starts off, you know, neutral. Um, and then there's some consideration of law versus chaos in terms of how they behave and what's important to the creatures and what have you. Um, but because of this very sort of mechanical approach, and I don't know that I got the impression that this is the way things are for Keith from the, from our interview with him. Um, I think he was a lot more fluid and, and narrative focused in his actual play. But the book kind of comes across as uh, dismissive almost of, of certain abilities or certain parts of the mechanics because it's just not useful in, um, in combat, right? There's, there's, there was a, a moment or two where, where he was describing one creature's abilities or one, you know, one of their spells or whatever and, and just said, well, and this is just fluff. This doesn't matter right now. We're, it's not combat useful, so move on. It doesn't inform us of you know, anything about what the creature would do. And I'm like, well, I don't know if that's necessarily the case. In the same way that like, I don't know that every creature that has dark vision by definition is also nocturnal, uh, you mm. know, uh, but he sometimes makes that, that assumption. Uh, and there's good, re like, and tactically and strategically, like, it makes sense. If you have dark vision, take advantage of that because not everything does, right? Um, mm -hmm. but, it, but it doesn't necessarily say... It doesn't necessarily always say the same thing about every creature in every setting, right? Uh, and, and I know um, in our conversation with him, Tracy, we asked him, you know, about the idea in Eberron, right? Uh, you know, does alignment function the same way in Eberron that it does in the core D and D setting? Because Eberron, you know, there is no no creature has sort of a set 
alignment, right? Um, you're just as likely to run into um, a good red dragon as an evil red dragon in Eberron, uh, as I understand it, right? How does that change the the analysis of, of all of that? Um, and I don't know. Um, I, and honestly, I don't know that his system of analysis necessarily works in terms of accounting for that. Um, at least that piece of it, right? I think the larger analysis right. still work. You know, the larger like this is the best tactics. This is you know what this how this creature fights and whatever still works. But in terms of like, do they fight to the death? What? Why do they start a fight? Eh, maybe it works and maybe it doesn't. And you kind of have to take that with a grain of salt. So uh, I think it does what it does really well. And it inspired me in a lot of ways. And there are some things where it's like, um, I, d I don't know. Maybe I can see where you're saying that, right? <laughs> you know? Um, right. And, th and there were some moments where, where he... And, 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 I, and I think he would be open to that. Because there were also moments in the in the book where he's like... You know, wizards did this with these creatures, and I don't really think that makes any sense. I would change the creatures. Like, he was as critical sometimes of the books, in the, the, the monster manual statistics, uh, as mm -hmm. I would might be of, of some of his approach to a few of those things, right? So, and I think he'd be okay with that. Yeah. And, Go ahead, Chase. And he, and, he, and he wasn't sure, just, I know people listen to the, the interview, but just... Uh, for, for right now, you know, he wasn't sure about whether or not it would change things because he hadn't really thought through it yet. Right. Uh, and he's unsure if he's doing that. Right. So exactly. it makes total sense. It was just one of those things that I, I just thought reading it, like, it, it's nice to have the assumptions written down at, 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 like he does at the kind of at the beginning about how he's going to approach thinking about ability scores and alignment and stuff like that, because if it turns out that you're in a world where those things are different, you probably want to check, double check the assumptions. I think that's fair. Any other sort of thoughts, uh, um, interesting sort of things that you feel like you learned, any particular advice that you liked or questioned? Uh, who's got any last thoughts before we wrap things up or at least toss it to the interview? Yes. Um, yeah, just, just real quick. I mean, I picked um, orcs and gnolls and minotaurs to kind of focus on in the reading, uh, among a few other things. Uh, but um, I wanted to see how he was going to kind of approach the, you know, uh, are they evil? Like, you know, what, uh, you know, what, what uh, place do they occupy in a campaign setting and, uh, and so on. And um, I actually kind of like that he didn't. Uh, he didn't just say gnolls or, you know, blasphemous, evil creatures and, you know, uh, all of them are just meant to be killed. There's a little bit in there of like, no, these things might fight to the death because that's kind of what they're, you know, raised to do works as well. But I mean, that wasn't really kind of a judgment call. So I felt like it was a nice, fair, balanced way of showing off the creatures without making any kind of uh, judgment calls on like what kind of creatures they are or how they fit in culturally or what have you. And there were some moments where he did like, there were some places where he absolutely talked about like these creatures are evil. These creatures are like embodiments of good. But when he did like one of the embodiments of good creatures was like, it's a unicorn. Right. <laughs> and, and, mm -hmm. and he goes on and on at one point about like, look, if your players are going to fight a unicorn, if they're going to go out and, and kill a unicorn, like, Throw the works at them. Like, make them really regret the idea that they're trying to kill a unicorn. Because that's not okay. Like, he seems to be really anti-killing unicorns, you know. Uh, so, um, but yeah. So, uh, but but yeah, for the most part, for at least for the, like, the intelligent humanoid races. Like, devils might be seen as just pure evil. Celestials, you know, mm -hmm. are good, right? Um, but those are also, yeah. like their role kind of in the in the cosmology of of creatures yeah you know? so um one thing that really stuck out to me and i don't know if it's just a me thing um so he did versions of D D and then dropped off for a while and then came back to help run a game for, for his wife's mm -hmm. for his wife using fifth edition and he does start using a language around and borrowing it probably pretty heavily from video games around what types of um, 
role or what roles different creatures fill according to their stat blocks like are they the the bruiser the brute type thing and stuff like that and it just i was like i wanted i kind of want to get him to read fourth edition (laughs) (laughs) because that was explicitly part of of what and i'm not saying you should go back and do but it was interesting that he came back to trying to use those that language to talk through the the different creatures and and stuff like that no, I, I still, um, fourth edition, playing fourth edition more than video gaming, because I've never been a huge video gamer, has um, definitely changed my thinking and my language in terms of thinking about creature roles or, or even PC roles. And sometimes I try to like, oh, well, this class is kind of a striker. C- kind of. Like, it's, it doesn't have as much role def- definition and protection as they did in fourth edition. Um, so it gets outside of that a little bit, but you can kind of still see, oh, well, you know, the warlock is the striker, the, the, the rogue is the striker with their sneak attack damage. And, you know, um, we don't. Right. And also just like, it might be useful to have that language again, and just not necessarily have the templates for what roles you have to fill in the, on the monster side to make a good balanced encounter. Well, and fourth edition was also really big into, into role protection like you have to have a certain number of each of these roles and if you have different co- combinations it changes the the tactics and how things should work and uh, whether or not a party can function right. and and uh, i think it's okay to blur the lines of what fits into what role um like we've got done in fifth right. edition but i think it's still useful language and still useful way of thinking about things mm-hmm. well and and in in fourth edition for the on the dm side they did have the charts of how many of each creature, uh, each role. each role you should have creature wise, mm. or yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, and uh, I would say too, just especially as a dungeon master, um, you know, you can borrow that from fourth edition. Like fifth edition has borrowed so many uh, unique things that have only made it better. But uh, you know, I think that's a really big point of this book is that you. Um, you don't live in this monster skin every time you run a game. Uh, so this helps you do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, if even if you have to boil da- them down to like a role or like a handful of abilities or, or a certain kind of behavior, um, like you were saying um, about spiritual weapon, you it's funny, I didn't know that until I started running someone who was a cleric and then they were all about it, did it every time. And it makes sense because it's part of their milieu. But um you know, unless you're unless you take a crash course on every single class, you don't see those kind of similarities as you play the monsters. But this is a little bit more of a kind of a cheat book that lets you say, "Oh, okay, I got to do this with this." Okay, these monsters work that way, and if you have them down to to roles, uh, that might be even more helpful because you've already got so many other things to to try and keep track of as a dungeon master. All right, I think that's our final thoughts. Tracy, you want to toss it so, to the interview? Yeah, let's go chat with the author, Keith Amon, and see what he has to say about the book. And for those of you in the stream, this is where we will edit that interview in. We already recorded it on Tuesday. And, and if you check Twitch, it should still be available um, right now uh, and set up on, um, on YouTube shortly if I haven't set it up there already. So uh, now we're going to do our outro and finish things up and that's the end of this episode thank you uh to all our listeners for supporting us by shopping at amazon and dms guild the links at tomeshow.com the tomeshow.com or who are patrons at patreon.com slash the tome show we also want to thank our guests ismail and keith and Ismail, if people want to find you, you are King Lorethorn or Elven Wizard King on all the social medias, right? Correct. <laughs> and you also run the the Tome Show's Facebook page. Uh, Correct. So, or at least most of it. Every now and then, I'll post something, but most of that's you. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. yeah, lion share. <laughs> and and if they want to find. Uh, your stuff on DMs Guild, you both under your name and under, from Fat Goblin Games, yes? Correct. So Ismael Alvarez, uh, which is a little bit harder to spell, but Fat, Fat Goblin Games, which is a little easier. Uh, and anything they do with 5th edition, there's a pretty decent chance I had a hand in it. There you go. 
You think Ish Ismail Alvarez is harder to spell than Lorathorn? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I plead the fifth. Okay, okay. All right. If people want to get a hold of us, you can email the tome show at gmail.com. You know, if you're trying to figure out how to spell Laura Thorne or Ismail, uh, you can email me and I'll, I'll set you up with that. You can find me on Twitter. I am at Squatch, S Q U A C H. Tracy is at Sarah Dark Magic. That's Sarah with an H and then Dark and then Magic. Uh, and you can tweet the show. It is at the Tome Show. Uh, and do that and ask us for our Discord link, and I can send you whatever the latest link is for our Discord channel where we've had all kinds of uh, conversations uh, as the days go by. Some days it's, it's real quiet and nobody says much, and then other days are like today where uh, I take a few hours off and I log in and there's 50-plus messages. You know? So um, it's, it's moving over there. And me dropping Hamilton references. Yeah, <laughs> And that's episode 340, where we got so good at monster strategy, we can now kill 20th level characters with a pack of goblins. In this episode of... The Tone. End the audio. All right. Tracy, are you ready to show us what you painted before I end the stream? I will admit it's super ugly, but sure. <laughs> <laughs> Just wasn't going tonight. Okay. <laughs> Alright. I'll post a picture later. Goodbye the stream. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. Bye stream. Bye stream. <laughs>